this week, I'm starting a new and very important series, The Disappearance of Marion Barter. I'm joined by the amazing Sally Layden, who has been searching for her missing mother, Marion, since 1997. Marion left Australia for the UK on Sunday, the 22nd of June, 1997, under the name Florabella Natalia Marion Remical. She had officially changed her name a month before leaving the country. Now, she apparently went to Tunbridge Wells, amongst other places in the UK. So if you were in Tunbridge Wells and met Marion, or know anything about Marion Barter, please do contact Sally on the Lady Vanishes Facebook page. The link is in the show notes. Also, I highly recommend that you listen to the podcast The Lady Vanishes, which details the extensive reinvestigation by Seven News' Alison Sandy, Brian Seymour, and Sally and team. You'll also hear some very familiar voices, as well as brilliant reporting and fantastic advocacy across the Lady Vanishes series. In this Crime Analyst episode, I hope to build on the Lady Vanishes' incredible work and case file, as Sally and I discuss in depth Marion's victimology and the timeline, as well as us highlighting the very real impact that Marion's disappearance has had on Marion's family over time and the disturbing way the case has been handled, which has had catastrophic consequences. For this reason, listener discretion is advised, as you may find our discussion upsetting and distressing. With that having been said, Let's dive into this very real, very honest and important interview with the fierce warrior and advocate, Sally Layden. I am really excited today to be joined by a very special guest who I've wanted to speak to for a very long time, but this is in fact the first time that we're talking. Please introduce yourself. Hi everybody, my name is Sally Layden and I am the daughter who's trying to find her mum, Marion Barter. She went missing in 1997 and last known to be in the UK. So it's been quite the journey. And thank you for having me, Laura. I love your show and I I love what you do for um, victims and their families. So thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, Sally. And thank you for joining me. And I have to say, you are just such an incredible warrior and advocate for your mother. And that was the first thing that struck me because I have been following your journey and your real fight, actually, to get answers as to what happened to your mother, Marion Barter. And we've never spoken before. This is really, this is the first time. And that's why it's a privilege for me to talk to you. And we should mention the incredible body of work that's been done on The Lady Vanishes, which is a podcast which I recommend everybody to listen to because we will keep going back to um, the work of Alison Sandy and the Seven News team and you in particular to, and really I call it a case file, actually. It's a case file and it's extensive. And for me, the answers are all there. So I'm really pleased to to be talking to you. I have talked to the Lady Vanishes, to Alison and the team before. And in fact, I was trying to remember, I went back to the extensive number of episodes that you've done on the Lady Vanishes. And I think it was around 2019 that, that I was aware of Marion's case, but I was contacted as well. And what struck me was... Um, what I call the victimology about your mother. So I'm going to ask you to talk about your mum, but also the fact that I've always said in all my casework, women don't just disappear. They don't just vanish into thin air and we have to ask questions and we have to be fierce advocates at times. And that's exactly what you've been. So let's start off wherever you want to, Sally. I'd love you to talk about your mum, but however you want to start off talking about your mother and the lady vanishes and what's been going on for you? Well, the first thing I sort of think when when you're speaking about all of that and the struggles and the the challenges that I've faced as the daughter of a missing woman, the first thing that comes to mind is I was constantly being told by authorities here in, in Australia that 
the police job is not about the why. So I kept saying to them, why did my mum come back to Australia? Why was she withdrawing $5,000 every day out of her bank account in Byron Bay when she's told me she's in the UK and having this amazing trip? And they just kept saying to me, it's not about the why. And I feel it's extremely important because in any other case, if you look at a homicide investigation, I guess, they always look at why. Why did that person do that to this person? Or how did that happen? And so it was quite frustrating for me as the daughter. Another example was that my mum's superannuation, which we have here in Australia, that is taken out of your wage each week to build up for your retirement. And you can access that when you hit 65. And she hadn't touched her superannuation. And so for me, I was like, well, if she's come back into the country and she's going to the bank every day for three and a half weeks and taking out $5,000 in a location that is not too far from my home, probably at the time the roads have changed a bit and improved, but around two and a half hour drive from my home, the police officer said to me, oh, well, it's a small price to pay for somebody who doesn't want to be found or wants to go missing for them not to touch their superannuation. And I just could not grapple with that at all. I, it just didn't make sense to me that someone would be so active in taking out all their money, yet they'd leave $20,000 odd sitting in a bank account untouched that she'd put away, obviously, for her trip. And she had Barclays Bank in the UK as the address for that account. That now has around still today, just shy of 15000 Australian dollars sitting in it, untouched. She's also got that superannuation still sitting there unclaimed. Now, she would be, how old would she be? 70. I think she's turning 78 this year in October. So, definitely of age where she could withdraw that money and, and use it if she was alive and well, as they tell me she is. Absolutely. And why would you go to the trouble of putting all that money aside and then not touching it? That just makes no sense. And just to backtrack, the why question, it's so important, the why question. The why question was always important to me my, in my work at New Scotland Yard and professional curiosity. And these are two things that I talk about in police training all the time. So first of all, I just want to apologise. Having worked in policing, that's not the response that you should get when you are talking about someone that you know very well and you understand their baseline behavior, that's what we call it, and there are all these anomalies that you've seen. And the anomalies are really important because you're saying that these are the things that just don't add up. And now we have the term coercive control, but I've got into legislation in the UK, and I've been working hard in Australia, and here in America, because we're talking, I'm in America, you're in Australia, we've managed to make the time zones work, but the language of coercive control is really important because if someone, a woman goes missing, she may well have been coerced. She may have been disappeared. So the first thing that someone should be thinking is about what you, the loved one, is telling them and what are the things that don't add up and what are the potential lines of investigation and what sort of risk level at risk from whom and what. So it is complex. And we're going back in time, aren't we? We're talking about 1997. And, you know, just as you're talking as well, I, I was thinking immediately as I was at the time, I became aware of your mother's case about Lynette Dawson, who people around Lynette were also told similar things when she just disappeared. And I really do think this is a problem across policing. And perhaps we'll talk a little bit about that after we've talked about Marion and, and her victimology, her, the type of person that she was and her characteristics. Because I do think that there is this switch that goes off, particularly when we talk about women that go missing or who have disappeared. And oftentimes the easiest answer is the one that someone might arrive at, despite you, Sally, explaining, but these are all the things that don't make sense. Mm. Well, it was quite upsetting for me and it still is today. And when I hear people say, oh, but she was 51 and she'd been married three times and divorced um, and she was capable of this behaviour. And I, I sit there and question that and say, how can you make a comment like that about a woman who's not here to defend herself and say what's actually happened without knowing the facts? And, you know, there were situations, there was a man in a car that Chris and I saw a late night and Chris had been helping her pack up her house when she was deciding to go on her trip. 
And um, she suddenly asked him to leave very abruptly. And he said, oh, I'll just finish packing this box, Marion. And he said, oh, no. She said, no, 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 just leave it. Just need you to go. And so he came and picked me up. I was studying late at night because I was working two jobs and studying, ironically, to get into the police force. Anyway, he picked me up and we stopped at a McDonald's. And while we were there, just having some dinner because it was quite late, and mum actually pulled up at the Bowser to get some petrol and she got out of the car and she stood there and Chris sort of tapped me and said, oh, look, there's your mum. And I turned around and was waving at her and it was kind of like a deer in headlights kind of vibe where she was looking at me but just staring at me in a bit of a shocked sort of look. And she had a man in the car. The man was quite tall. He was nearly touching the roof. And he had dark features, is my memory. And obviously, we're going back 26 years too. And if I can add, the police didn't take a statement from me until 13 years after my mum went missing. So I think a lesson I have learned through that, and I'd like to share with people too, is make sure you ensure that everything is written down and everything is well documented if something like this does happen because it's key Um, and sometimes you have to do it yourself when I mean I was just rolling with the punches thinking that everything was being handled well not really realizing what was going on behind the scenes and that that wasn't quite normal anyway we have a man in the car and I always thought to myself maybe there was a man involved my mum was a beautiful human and I talk in past tense, if I may, because I don't believe she's with us anymore, if that's okay, as sad as um, that makes me feel. But she was a beautiful human. She was an exceptional cook. She was an amazing school teacher. She just won the Best Teacher in Queensland Award the November before she left in the June of 97 and loved her garden, loved classical music, also loved Laura Brannigan and Lionel Richie. And I've just made a playlist actually of all her favourite songs and I've been belting them out at home and um, the tears flow quite often when I listen to them, but it's a good it's a good feeling to know that um, it's a bit of mum's memory in, in my world. She was a great person, but she was also a very, very much a person that needed to be loved. I don't know in particular that she needed to be married but she liked having a relationship. She likes having someone to go to the ballet with and likes having somebody to have dinner with. And I think that's quite normal. I think, yes, she had three marriages and unfortunately those marriages didn't kind of pan out the way she wanted them to. So her first husband was a soccer legend here in Australia or football legend, Johnny Warren, who was captain of the Australian Socceroos at the time when they were married and all over the front news of front news um, papers and um, she loved him very much and unfortunately they struggled to have babies and that put a lot of pressure on their relationship and John was also very busy with um, being captain of New South Wales and captain of Australia and traveling a lot with football so I think the pressures got too much and from what I've learned through the journey is that John ended up leaving mum and then she met my father and um she very quickly had Owen and myself. So I was born and Owen was born. She was still breastfeeding me when she fell pregnant. So I think for her, someone who has been trying to have a baby for such a long time and then instantly fall pregnant, she was with my dad and then they got married when I was about four. And then they separated uh, and divorced a few years later. And then she was single for quite a long time. And then she met my stepfather, Ray Barter. And again, she was very much in love with him and did everything for him. He showed Afghan hounds and we would go to dog shows every weekend in support of him. And she'd, I remember she'd bring all her school work with her and she'd sit there under umbrellas while he's showing the dogs, doing all her school work and writing report cards, etc. So she was very dedicated to him as well. But things that I have learnt through this process now is that... She was very vulnerable. And if I use Ray as a good example, she'd been, from my understanding, she'd been on maybe two or three dates with him. And Owen and I had been at our father's house for the weekend, as we typically did every fortnight. And we'd come off the train and we hopped in the car and she said, oh, I've just got to tell you guys something. And I said, oh, what? what's going on? And she said, oh, I've got a man coming to live with us. And I looked at Owen in the back seat and I was like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> And we got home and Ray was in the kitchen cooking a meal with mum. And I remember we just beelined it straight through the back door, out the laundry and onto the trampoline. I don't even remember if we said hi to him because I was in a little bit of shock that this man was now living in our home and I'd never even met him before. 
But that's just taught me a little bit think about mum because my memory of that situation was that Ray had told her that he needed to leave his wife and three boys and he needed somewhere to go and mum took him in. And I think that shows the generosity of my mum, but I sometimes feel that that may have been abused a little bit in her generosity. And because that was quite shocking for Owen and I, um, when I look back and I think about my children, if I did that to them, how they might feel about that situation. And I just feel like, yeah, that the situation maybe have, um, could have been handled a little bit better, but it shows a vulnerability of my mum, I think, and someone who is very kind and caring and um, always happy to help where she could. And that potentially has maybe got her into the situation she is of being missing. Yes, it's interesting you describe it as a vulnerability because being caring, being compassionate, being thoughtful and trying to help people, these are really positive characteristics. Unfortunately, there can be people who exploit them. And I would agree with you, it is a vulnerability, but isn't it interesting, you know, how that very positive side to someone's character and particularly women and your mother can be used and exploited in a way and you know perhaps she did want male company and there are lots of women certainly of a certain age and I'll put you know your mother there who probably grew up to believe that you should be with someone you know now there's a very different way of thinking that you don't need a man you can do things on your own um, but when we go back in the day, the the idea of being with someone socially, that's what was acceptable. And maybe it made her feel more secure and comforted and loved in a relationship. And I did hear Deirdre Stewart, and whether you agree with her or not, I don't know. But she talked about how your mother loved to be in love. And, and I know people like that. They love the idea of love. They love being in love. And it is this, you know, wonderful feeling. And some people keep chasing that, um, you know, the six month of when you're falling in love with somebody. There are some who love to be in relationships and being dependent. And that can be part, it almost becomes part of someone's character. And I know your mother's been described like that by some, and it's not even a criticism. It's just through generations, it's how we can be groomed and socialized to want that, desire that, and need that, and feel wholehearted when we're with someone. Um, I don't know whether you would share that. I always think, you know, when we're children, we don't really know our parents in their, you know, love life world. And you've been on this journey discovering lots of things about your mother as an investigator and as a detective, really. You mentioned about joining the police, but you've been a detective here and an investigator and you've been discovering all these things. Maybe you knew some of it, but not all of it. That's been an odd part of this journey for me because I felt like my mum's privacy potentially was, I was not privy to that. I didn't know as a child what she was doing or the relationship she was having. And she was my mum and I didn't, I didn't have the right to ask questions. And even as a 25 year old, when I saw the guy in the car at McDonald's, I didn't sit there and quiz her on it. I just said, who was in the car with you? And she said she'd met him at the art centre and he was a friend of a mutual friend and he was taking her out to say goodbye before her trip. And I was satisfied with that. As a person, I didn't feel it was my job to sit there and quiz my mum on who she was going out with. Deirdre is my mum's sister. My mum is the eldest of four sisters and Deirdre is um, the second eldest. And they talked about in our, through the inquest as well, about, you know, how my grandfather used to sit there and call my mum marrying Marion. And there was a lot of, I think Deirdre even said that her parents always were of the opinion that you get married once and once only. And um, so there was this stigma around the fact that mum had been married and divorced three times and therefore it was not kosher for them and they weren't satisfied or happy that she was doing that. And potentially if she met somebody new who she fell in love with, that I can understand as a 50-year-old woman myself why she potentially might not have shared that information with us initially until she knew it was solid because she didn't want the backlash and she didn't want the criticism that she had seen previously and I I had seen and heard myself even as a child. So that's kind of sad to think about as well. Yes. And and they're very interesting points that you've just shared about the the family and the structure um, and this marrying Marion. Because when somebody's been quite open about things, 
which your mother had been. And it seems, and I mean with friends, that she, people characterised her by saying she wore her heart on her sleeve. So she did say things that were on her mind. And then when she disappeared, just prior to that, and I always talk about the timeline because the timelines are are really important as well as victimology. And I always said the three to four months before she went missing, that's what needs to be zeroed in on. You know, of what's going on, of big life changes or changes in character, personality. But your mother ticked really every box of big changes, becoming secretive and not telling people about even her changing her name and wanting to change direction totally, resigning from the school that she worked in, talking about going abroad and possibly working in England and that being seen as, you know, potentially a good professional thing to do. But she sold everything. She gave things away. She sold her house at a loss, which is a very, it tells me there's a time issue that she has a fixed lens about a date and she wants to get out. So there were things that were going on just prior, the the three months before the spring of 1997, that were very significant. Are there other things that you just want to add to that, Sally? Because baseline is very important to know and things that happen within a family that could potentially not trigger in and of itself a significant move, but become part of a perfect storm, that multiple things happen simultaneously. And I believe with her mother, there was a there was some friction with an argument, which I don't think was big enough on its own for her to make this decision. But sometimes in life, we get these perfect storms. And it sounds to me like these three months before she went, there were some critical things that she did that was different and big changes and decisions that she took about the future of of her life. The thing that sticks out to me the most with those big changes was the fact that the award-winning teacher, the best teacher in Queensland in Australia, she came second overall. She would never leave her children or her class halfway through the year. And she did that. And that was something that I said, that's out of character for my mum. That's not something she would do because she knew how detrimental that could be to the children. And I felt like something was going on that she was disengaging. I've even spoken to a friend of hers and mum taught both of her sons and her first son, mum became so close with her that she asked mum to be his godmother. And then she had, mum had the second son as well. And I remember her sounding quite upset and angry with mum and frustrated that she was disengaged and she wasn't herself and she wasn't doing as much as she had done with her previous son in the class. And If you sort of spin that back and go, well, let's think about what was happening in that first trimester of the year or semester. The school starts here in Australia in February and she's left and resigned by June. And in that time frame, she decided that she was going to resign, that she was going to sell her house, which she did within three weeks and at a loss, as you said, of 15,000 Australian dollars, which was quite a lot of money back then. She gave me her car. And we had made a deal because I, I had a newer car than she, than hers, but I liked her car more. So she, I said, can I sell my car and I'll give you the money for my car when I sell it? And she agreed to that and she signed the car over to me as a gift. And she then proceeded to pack up all her things. As you said, she gave special things to certain people. And she had told Chris and I, Chris is my husband, he was my fiancé at the time, And she had told us that um, she was going to buy a unit at Main Beach, which is probably, to give your listeners an idea, about 10 minutes drive from where she was living, but on the beachfront on the Gold Coast. And she said, when I come back, I'm going to buy a unit. Um, I won't have room for all of my big antique furniture, which she'd been collecting for years. So I'm going to give it to you. She said, you'll inherit it one day anyway, so you might as well have it now. She'd given some things to her friend, Leslie, who she'd been staying with for a few weeks before she left after she'd sold the house and some things to my brother. We all thought that was pretty normal. She said that she'd put the bulk of her things, like all her good china. She had a massive Massive collection of Royal Dalton figurines. Um, she had a, a great record collection and all those sorts of things. I don't know where they are. They went into storage and she told me that if I decide to stay over in the UK and teach, I'll just get you to send them over for me. And I kick myself every day for not asking where she stored that those belongings because I still to this day don't know where they are and not without trying. We've, we've searched every storage shipping container company from 
the Gold Coast right down to northern New South Wales trying to search for those belongings without any luck at this stage. So it all seemed quite plausible to me that she decided, I know there was a bit of friction at school after she won the award. Um, It's a very high profile school here in Queensland. It's a boys school, private school. There was a bit of tall poppy syndrome going on now that she'd won this award and some teachers didn't like the way she taught because she was more like a Steiner school, I would say, style of teaching where she she was talking about the beach. Instead of sitting in the classroom, she'd take all the boys down to the water's edge because the school was right on the canal and they'd play in the sand while she was teaching them and reading them the story. And that was her style. And there was teachers who didn't approve of that and didn't think that was the way it should be and uh, were adopting things like letter land. And mum was like, well, I don't, I don't like the way letter land works. So that's not what she wanted to do. And you know, as I've learned, as we were talking before, investigating my mum essentially about who she was and digging really deep, I've learned that she was quite the powerhouse in her own realm. Like she liked things to be done the way she liked them to be done. I'm probably a little bit the same. My husband will tell you probably, but um, in a good way, you know, like she only ever had good heart and, and good thought process behind everything she was doing, but could have come across and, you know, probably not everybody liked her because she wanted to do things her way. Well, I was going to say, Sally, that none of what you're describing is a bad thing, you know, and I think it's interesting, particularly when we go back in time, that she won the the awards are very important and it elevated her profile and then people got professionally jealous, which does happen. And her being a woman as well and knowing her own mind, you know, I think it's interesting. People say, oh, she was opinionated, but we'd never say that about a man. A man just shares his point of view. He's not opinionated. So I always think about the things that if you flip the script, would you say the same about a man? Or would you say she had a certain style of teaching that was much more experiential and being out and doing, much more relatable to children? And maybe it's not somebody else's style, but it's still her style. And it sounds like she was very effective and very good at doing that. She was. She was an exceptional teacher. And there's, I was lucky enough to go to the same primary school as where she taught. So I am friends with a lot of the students that mum taught. And they, I'm friends with them on Facebook. And they're always commenting about, you know, how their love of classical music and going to Capelia at the opera house with my mum. And I remember Owen and I always go, went with her because she didn't have a partner. So we would go on the excursions too and she'd stand at the front of the bus and she'd explain the whole ballet to everybody before we got there so everyone knew what was happening on stage and she just loved that and these these people who I'm friends with and who I went to school with in primary school myself always reminisce and always talk about her perfume and, and how she used to talk to them in French when she would come into the classroom in the morning and special songs that she sung and one woman in particular, Catherine, she talks about how she sings the same song that my mum taught to her in grade three. So what would we be in grade three? Around nine years old and so she sings those songs to her children now and she thinks of my mum often and you know they're very special memories for me and when I hear those it really makes me smile and it's nice for my children to hear those things as well because they don't know their grandmother and that's very heartbreaking for me because I know she would have adored them and been a great um, role model for them and and taught them a lot of culture and things that um, maybe it's not the norm these days, but she had a special way of doing it and people really loved that. So sad she's not here to share it. Yeah. And her legacy lives on. You know, that's a really important part that she stood out as a teacher, that people still remember the things that she spoke about and the songs that she sang. And that legacy continues on through the next generation. But that was one of the things that I remember you saying, she wouldn't have abandoned her children, you and Owen. And that was one of the things she didn't send a birthday card or didn't call your brother when it was his birthday. And that stood out to you. So the fact that she, you know, for all intents and purposes, disappeared and didn't continue a connection with you and Owen, that was a big red flag for you. And that now, of course, you've got your grandchildren and just hearing you talk about how she was with children and how much she wanted you, you were so wanted as children. The fact that she just disappears, that sounds so out of keeping and such a big red flag for me. I'm sure for you, because you've been living this, you know, my question was always, you know, what are the things that stood out to you that made you absolutely believe that you should trust your gut, that something something had happened to your mother and you had to keep asking questions? And some of them you've described. There were many things and abandoning, in inverted commas, you and Owen, 
were definitely key things that that stand out here. And I think the police labelled that situation that Owen and I were settled and mum had said that herself to her friends. You know, she felt quite comfortable to go overseas on this trip because Chris and I had built a house and we just got engaged and she'd come and celebrated our engagement party with us. And Owen was engaged as well and he was living in Sydney with his partner of 10 years. So, We were very settled and hence why we weren't in a position to go, oh, you can't leave us, mum. You can't go overseas. She just said she was going for a year and that she would come back by October 1998 when I got married. So she'd be there for my wedding day. And so I've had to wind myself back through that 18 months of my mum leaving to the date. So she left on the 22nd of June, 1997, and I got married on the 24th of October, 1998. So that should have been the happiest year of my life, planning my wedding. And I was in this turmoil of, you know, people telling me to leave it alone. The police told me that they'd spoken to my mum and she didn't want to be found. And then I had, you know, mum's family just telling me to leave it alone. And she's not missing. She's probably just having a break. Why would you go and list her as a missing person? And then, you know, I'm driving up to the chapel at TSS where my mum taught. And that was something that she'd organised for me before she left was so that Chris and I could be married in the chapel because you had to be an old boy to get married there. And um, as we're driving up, I'm in a soft top car with my dad and my dad says to me, oh, keep an eye out for your mother. I'm sure she'd be here. She wouldn't miss this. And so as I... I'm driving up, about to walk down the aisle, looking, going, oh, stop, Dad. Like, don't say that. It was a very stressful moment for me because I didn't know if she was alive or not. I didn't know if she never wanted to see me again. My brother was there as well, and it was a very special time for us because my brother is no longer with us anymore. So that was kind of like the last time I got to see him before he took his own life. And, you know, if I, that's a whole nother story, but he essentially took his own life because the police had told us and the Salvation Army that they'd found my mum and that she'd spoken to certain people and bank tellers and things like that and said that she was starting a new life and she didn't want anything to do with her family. And Owen didn't cope very well with that. And you can, we do big deep dives on this in the podcast, but, you know, he took his own life at 27 thinking, that, you know, his mother had abandoned him and that has been life-changing for me. I don't have any other siblings. So I'm here on my own um, and even today, mum sisters still don't talk to me because they feel like this is upsetting for them that I keep dragging it up and I keep, you know, doing digs. And I don't mean for it to be upsetting for anybody. It's certainly upsetting for me. It's upsetting for my children. I know my husband gets very upset and frustrated and angry about the situation. And that's not what I want for any of this. And I know my mum wouldn't want that either. And when things do get a pretty tricky and tough, I do have her in the back of my head saying, don't put yourself through this. I'm now on heart medication because my resting blood pressure uh, or heart rate was up around the 190 at times going through the inquest. So I, I have to pull myself back sometimes, but I know there's a fight here for answers and I'm very close, I feel, to getting answers. So I have to keep going for her legacy to know that and to help other people too. I want people to know that Don't give up and don't just listen to what authorities think or assume because assuming is the most annoying part of my life in this situation because all of the facts that I have been given are based on assumptions only. They're not facts. So it's very difficult to manage when people are talking about your missing loved one and they're just assuming that she's just left on her own account for whatever given reason when there's no uh, facts behind it and no proof that that is actually the case. Sally, you said so many important things there. and Sorry if I talk a lot. (laughs) No, (laughs) I'm I'm glad that you did. I just wanted to listen intently. And your brother, Owen, you know, first, I'm so sorry to hear that. And often we don't hear about the legacy of what happens to families after. And in particular, when you have contact with the police or with, with others, and maybe they tell you something that to them isn't that big a deal, But to you, it's life shattering. It is catastrophic. And if a message is delivered without any actual evidence to back that up, that's even more devastating and catastrophic. And it just shouldn't happen. You know, the only way you can say that someone is not missing and that it's of their own volition is that you go and see them and you have eyes on them and you understand their situation isn't, they haven't got a coercive controller around them, that this is genuinely their own desire and wish. 
And that didn't happen in your mother's case. It wasn't that there were eyes on her and there wasn't an understanding about coercive control then either. So that catastrophic impact and Owen and yourself having to grapple with these emotions as if it's fact that you had indeed been abandoned when you hadn't, that's just devastating to hear. And it should never happen. It should never happen. You know, law enforcement, if they deliver the, those sorts of messages, must have very clear very specific evidence. And I've worked numerous cases where someone has been taken off somewhere else and they're being coercively controlled. It's not of their own volition. So even when we have eyes on them, we should have experts like myself to really understand what, what's going on and the catastrophic event, your brother taking his own life and the impact for you and your health and others in your family saying to leave it alone. We understand, and I can understand and have empathy for why, but I also have an understanding for you that you need to know. And all what you're doing is exactly what you need to be doing for you. And you are important in this too. And you joined up a lot of dots in a far more rigorous way, actually. And where we have ended up today and the coronial inquest is still ongoing, but there have been key things that you have uncovered with Alison Sandy and the team from going to the UK, from going to Luxembourg, from such an extensive investigation because you asked questions rather than just two and two equals five and that's it. I'm just going to leave it there. You've asked the questions and it's been a rigorous investigation and where we are today is that all the evidence points in one direction. And it's a very different direction to what you were told. And perhaps we'll get there. But I just wanted to talk to you about the things that you had shared and mentioned, because you are still going through this. We know that, is it May 31st that the coronial inquest will reconvene? So there's three days. And so you're still very much in this at the moment. And you will always be in it because it's your life. But you fought so hard, you know, 26 years of fighting for answers for the basics, for the bare minimum. I don't know how that feels, Sally, but what I greatly admire is your fierce determination for your mother, who's no longer here. You've been her voice and you've been such an incredible warrior. And, you know, I'm in awe of you to keep going and keep asking questions when things have been so difficult and so challenging and when you've been the lone voice, really, you know, in the ether. And thank goodness you've had Alison Sandy and team around you to basically support you in that very rigorous investigation. And of course, where you are now today, having looked at the timeline, having followed up on all the key pieces of information that have come from so many disparate areas and people and places, it really is just commendable where you are. And I, you know, my, my thought about the coronial inquest is that you get the right decisions that are made. In my mind, there's really only one determination and decision that can be made. But I'm getting ahead of ourselves there. I, I'd like to sort of backtrack just to talk about when you found out key pieces of information that Marion was taken off the missing persons list, the, the things that kept you asking questions, what were the key things in your mind that you just knew that that wasn't your, your mother's doing or decisions without an outside influence? Because I think you felt, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you felt there was an outside influence at work on your mother, certainly more in the latter stages, but I think you believed, and you can correct me, that there was somebody else involved in decisions that were being taken. I'm jumping in here to wrap the episode. I really don't want us to lose sight of what Sally just shared. The police telling her and her brother Owen that their mother didn't want to see them had a profound and devastating consequence on both Sally and Owen. Owen ended his life because of it. Marion's disappearance and the way it was handled has had such a catastrophic consequence on her children and the impact on Sally still continues. She needs answers. And my hope is that the coroner's inquest, which has now ended, will provide more information and more answers. And that if you are listening and you know anything about Marion, whether you met her in the UK or know anything about the case, please do contact Sally.
on the Facebook page The Lady Vanishes. In terms of the coroner's inquest, we're waiting for a decision as of September the 29th when I'm recording this. In the next episode, you'll hear Sally's answer to my question and so much more, and I guarantee you won't want to miss it. Until next time, be curious, ask questions, and always trust your instincts.